All right, welcome everybody. Welcome to the Trip Botanic Temple. Um, thank you all for coming out here today. Uh, John Michael Greer is an author of over 30 books on a wide variety of subjects ranging from peak oil to nature and spirituality. Uh, his books include Long Descent, uh, Newton's Guide to the End of the Industrial Age, <clears throat> The Wealth of Nature, Economics as its Survival Matter, and The Drew Your Handbook, which is a spiritual practice rooted in the living earth. John is the Grand Archbishop of the Ancient Druidic Order of America, and he also um, <laughs> he also regularly posts on his weekly blog, the Archbishop Report. So please welcome John McGregor. <laughs> for everybody, all of it made possible by <coughs> infinite resources <laughs> and the unstoppable march of technology. By the year 2000, you'd be able to hop on an, ST, an SST, you right Detroit Airport, for the two-hour flight to Kennedy Spaceport down in Florida, plop down your money for a ticket to the moon. That's the future we were promised. It wasn't just propaganda either. Back in the 1960s, Conrad Hilton, the owner of the Hilton Hotel chain, had an agreement with NASA. Once they got the cost per pound to orbit down below a certain level, he would build the first, he'd pay for the building of the first Hilton Hotel in space. He expected to make a mint of it. Um, on a rather more pedestrian scale, but he didn't tell him. I remember a parking garage in downtown Seattle that had a helipad on the top floor, complete with its own little air, air traffic control tower and places for helicopter commuters to park their copters. <laughs> Went up in the 1960s, was torn down in the late 1990s to be replaced by some condos unusually ugly, even by Seattle standards. <laughs> in all the years it was there, I don't think a single helicopter ever landed it. It's a good metaphor for our time. Because we've spent a lot of the last 30 years or so building landing pads for a lot of things that are never going to arrive. There's a lot of that going on today, too. A lot of thinking about the future that basically amounts to singing lullabies. You know the sort of thing I mean. We can have whatever future we want. We all just have to be optimistic and idealistic and believe. This is basically the Tinkerbell theory of history. Okay. I'm not going to waste your time with the Tinkerbell future because we have serious things to talk about today. We can, start, we can start talking about them in any number of ways. I'm going to choose a way that will probably seem unlikely to most of you, uh, because it doesn't start with jetpacks or with lullabies, it starts with druidry. You probably, well, of course, you've all been told that I'm a druid. You may know that I serve as presiding officer of one of the half dozen or so relatively large druid orders in America today. You may also know that my blog, one of, which is one of the most popular blogs in the small section of the internet that's discussing the future of industrial civilization, is called the Archdruid Report. Unless you happen to read the Archdruid Report, which some of you may, um, you're probably wondering why, what a druid is doing here standing here talking about peak oil in the future of industrial society. It's a common question, and the answer goes right to the core of what I want to talk about today. Mention druids to most people these days, and you call up a jumble of images involving Stonehenge, white robes, tree hugging, uh, and bad fantasy fiction. Lots of that. All wrapped up in a vague sense of Celtic antiquity. Now, none of that is actually that relevant to druidry as it exists today. Um, the modern druid movement has no connection with the ancient druids, and most of us admit that. Um, although it does have a penchant for white robes, does the occasional ceremony at Stonehenge, and I'm sorry to say that some participants in the movement do have, including myself, do have a reprehensible taste in bad fantasy novels. Um, <laughs> if you want to trace it to its roots, you don't end up among the ancient Celts. You end up in early 18th century Britain, in a landscape that certainly most of you are familiar with Detroit would recognize at a glance, the landscape of the early Industrial Revolution. Now, a lot of people nowadays think of air pollution toxic waste dumps, environmental devastation, as purely modern habits brought to us by the march of progress. Think again. All of that was a constant feature of life in the industrial wastelands and urban slums of Britain in the early 1700s. The explosive growth of industrialism was ravaging the British landscape and ecology, and not coincidentally forcing the majority 
into poverty so extreme that half the population of England could not afford to get enough to eat. That state of affairs was loudly justified by a dogmatic religious establishment, and it was praised with equal enthusiasm by the equally dogmatic, though less institutionalized, scientific materialism of the time. Those were the two acceptable mainstream ideological options. Please come in. Um, you, I'm sure you got lost somewhere down in the hallways. <laughs> Didn't know they happened. Um, those were the two mainstream attitudes that, that were acceptable in Britain at those times. And it was in that context that a small group of intellectuals decided they were going to vote for none of the above. I call them intellectuals. It would be at least as accurate to call them eccentrics. And I'm not sure it would be all, all that unfair to call them, well, crackpots. It takes a very unusual kind of mind to look at everything you've ever taught to remember as <coughs> true, recognize that those things are what's causing the problems that everybody thinks those truths are going to fix, and head off in a completely new direction. The direction these particular crackpots chose was one we might as well call nature spirituality the attitude, or if you will, recognition, that living nature is the most, the most accessible, most definitive source of meaning, value, and insight that's available to us. And the model they used for their nature spirituality, back then, the early 18th century, and the name they took for themselves as a result came from the very little that was known then about the ancient Celtic Druids. Now, all of this makes it sound very austere, very intellectual, I know. And there was that dimension to it. The founders of the Druid Revival, as, as the movement came to be called, drew very heavily on some of the Greek philosophers that followed Plato, and some of the more unusual branches of Christian thought on the other hand. But of course, once you start calling yourself Druids, you're pretty much guaranteed to attract people who want white robes and colorful rituals of stone circles, then austere mystical philosophy. And the robes, the rituals, and the general era of alternative thinking um, attract a fairly lively crowd. So by the 1740s, there was a Druid group meeting to celebrate the solstices and the equinoxes in suburban London. By the 1790s, you had the first Druid group um, in, here in, um, United, in what was just becoming the United States, up in the Hudson Valley. Um, by the early years of the 19th century, the, the by then very ornate Druid ritual got adopted as one of the attractions of Welsh festivals of poetry and music, where it's still very much part of the, of the way things are done today. So, for almost 300 years now, there have been Druids running around getting underfoot in Europe, America, and, and Australasia. Not a huge number of us. The one estimate I know, which was done about uh, what, 20 years ago, put the number of Druids in the world about 2 million. I suspect it's the same now, maybe a bit more. It's not a large movement, in other words. And its chances of becoming a large movement are not very high. We don't have a nice neat set of dogmas to handle for. Um, we don't proselytize or persecute or do any of the things that really successful religions do. <laughs> and what we have instead is ritual, meditation, quite a bit of that austere philosophy I mentioned. A lot of stuff that has to be learned and practiced, in other words, and can't just be absorbed by sitting in a pew and listening to somebody else talk. So it's not for everybody. But it was very much what I was looking for back in the day when I was young, rather silly, and wandering the wasteland of American intellectual life looking for something that more or less made sense. How I ended up at the head of the Druid Order is another story, which we'll get to in a bit. Still, one part of it is relevant to the theme I want to develop here. Um, I, want, I came of age in the 1970s, the middle, in the middle of the energy crisis and the environmental activism of that vanished time. I grew up with Woodsy Owl. How many of you remember? Give a hoot, don't pollute. <laughs> there you go. I spent my teen years reading The Limits to Growth and cheerful literature of the same kind. And when I went to college in 1980, I, I studied appropriate tech and organic gardening. Of course, when I went to college in 1980, America was on the brink of turning its back on the promising initiatives of those times in favor of a line of twaddle that insisted that it's morning in America. Remember that line? <laughs> Looking back on the days before that line, particular line of twaddle got its 15 minutes of fame, the thing that strikes me most is how naive we were in the Green Movement in those days. Those of us who were busy building small-scale wind turbines and double-digging organic garden beds, getting our master conserver certificate and so on, we were certain that when it came down to it, when the choice had to be made, the American people would find the guts to suck it up, tighten their belts, and do what had to be done to guarantee a better future for their grandchildren's grandchildren. The idea that we collectively choose to throw it all away to burn through the temporary surplus provided by the Alaska North Slope and North Sea oil fields, and say, hey, I'll be dead before the crisis hits, why should I care? 
that never entered our darkest dreams. And when it happened, when all of a sudden the Foxfire book and John Denver went out of fashion and the material girl and Gordon Gecko came in, <laughs> and we got to see just how many people had been along for the ride and jumped onto the Reagan bandwagon with as much apparent enthusiasm as they jumped on ours. I wasn't the only person who stayed off that bandwagon. As America took its 30-year 30, 30 vacation from reality, some of the others are in the room. But sometimes it felt that way. I learned early on that you did not try to talk to people about it. But it took me years to realize why that was, to notice how much the pose of sophisticated cynicism that became so popular in the Reagan years, this sort of brittle, jeering mood of the time, was an attempt to cover up a severely troubled national conscience. I've talked to many people since who described the sense, of, the sense of guilty relief they felt when they traded in their high mileage compacts for SUVs and cashed in their conservative lifestyles for a good long wallow in the trough of consumerism. It was easy to do, everyone else was doing it, and they jeered at the few of us who didn't with a kind of angry derision you only get from people who cash in their ideas and know it. So, for a while it seemed to work. Pumping the notes to the North Slope, the North Sea, like there was no tomorrow, on top of the very real energy conservation gains made in the 70s, crashed the price of oil to levels corrected for inflation lower than ever in human history. Not much above $10 a barrel. Okay? The Soviet Union imploded. Its oil production was its only source of, of, of hard currency, and that was what was keeping their mummified economic system going. And so everything looked, looked fine <clears throat> until the price of oil started going up again. And the, the thing is, we knew why. We knew that that was coming. Back in the 1970s, we talked about why that was coming. Oil doesn't just run out. You know, you use it, you use it, you use it, it's gone. Okay, no. What happens is that every oil well has a production curve. It starts slow, rises quickly to peak production, hits a plateau for a while, and then tapers off. Okay. As for geological reasons, you can't extract the oil faster than that. Remember, it's not just sitting there in a tank, it's in pores in the rocks. It has to be extracted bit by bit. So every oil field has every oil field made of various wells has a rounder curve, actually fairly close to the bell-shaped curve, though the mathematics are different, our, st our statisticians will want to know that. Um, every oil province, that's what petroleum geologists call an area with an oil, oil very formation in, say the back and shale. Um, that's another round curve. Every nation has a curve like that, and so does the world. Although you couldn't say that in public for many years, no. <clears throat> Presumably, the world was flat, and we could continue to expand our oil production to the continents that nobody's discovered yet, or something. I don't know. At any rate, the United States reached the peak of its curve in 1972. That's what drove the energy crisis, the crises of, that, of the following decade. No matter how hard we drilled and pumped, we'd already scooped the cream. Oil, old oil fields were going out of production faster than new ones were coming online because we'd already found and pumped all the good prospects. Domestic production, production is slow. By the way, despite all the hand waving about the Bakken shale, the Marcellus shale, we're still only producing a fraction of the oil we produced in 1972. The peak of American oil production was predicted well over a decade in advance. And all those books from the 70s I mentioned a moment ago, they applied the same math to the world, to the world oil production and came up with a very straightforward prediction that world oil production would peak and begin its decline sometime in the very early years of the 21st century. Now, of course, the, mo the immediate reaction for most people, quite possibly from some of you here today, certainly most people in the United States and the world's other industrial nations is, okay, well, no problem. We'll find something else to run to fuel our SUVs and our jumbo jets and all the other um, trappings of what Dick Cheney called our non-negotiable lifestyle. <clears throat> We'll burn more coal. Well, except we don't actually have anything like as much coal as the coal industry likes to tell the stock market there is. And we're already digging out of the ground very nearly as fast as we can, and oh, there's this little problem with global warming. <clears throat> okay, we'll burn more natural gas. Uh, same problem with global warming. And even with the current bubble in shale gas, there's actually not that much in reserve. And yes, we're, we're pumping it very fast as well. Okay, uranium, we'll build nuclear reactors. Well, that's running short, too. We'll hit peak uranium in 2015 worldwide. Nuclear reactors are very, very difficult to, very expensive to build and maintain. And there's that little problem with waste that you have to keep out of the biosphere for a quarter of a million years before it becomes safe. <coughs> renewables, okay, renewables. Renewables are great, 
but they're diffuse. You'll hear a piece of a kind of thought stopper that does the green circuit fairly often that says that because the total amount of sunlight falling on the planet or wind blowing across its surface is ump times the world's total energy use, which is true. But it's like saying there's trillions of dollars of gold in the world's oceans. Try extracting it in a way that's even as cost effective. Renewables are diffuse. They're what will have when fossil fuels are gone. They're great. They have to be developed. And it's possible to support a decent, humane existence on renewables, but we cannot support our SUV lifestyles on wind turbines and solar panels. We're probably not going to maintain cars. Nobody wants to hear that. Nobody certainly wanted to hear that then. And so we collectively stuck our fingers in our ears and scrunched our eyes shut and said to Mother Nature, la la la, I can't hear you, <laughs> as though she cares. <laughs> I want to go a little further into why we can't simply swap out another energy source for petroleum. Partly because that's the automatic reaction of everybody when they come face to face with the implications of peak oil. And partly because it leads to the core of what I'm trying to say in both my capacities as a peak oil writer and as a druid. There are some issues with energy sources that most of us don't notice because we've been spoiled by cheap, abundant petroleum. The first, which I mentioned a moment ago, is energy density. We don't think about that because raw petroleum is among the most energy-dense, naturally occurring substances in the known universe. I'd like each of you to, think, to perform a little thought experiment. Okay. While we're sitting there, imagine that you were to get up right now, find your way back out of the uh, out of the temple, go find a, a compact car, shift it into neutral, and push it down the road for 30 miles as fast as you can. Okay. Imagine the sheer muscular effort we are talking here. That much energy is in one gallon of gasoline. That's energy density. Try to guess how many fully charged car batteries you need to, or how, how much, the way fully charged car batteries you need to have that much energy. One ton of car batteries to hold as much energy as in one gallon of gasoline. <laughs> okay. We're used to having that kind of energy at our beck and call every minute of every day. And it seems normal to us. Just as it seems normal to stick a plug in a socket anywhere we go, and right there there's electricity. 110 volts, um, 60 cycles per second, right there, no worries. That's not normal. Not in terms of any other human society that has ever existed or will ever exist on this planet. And it's only possible because fossil fuels are what happens when you take a half billion years of sunlight, feed it through photosynthesis and a whole series of geological processes in the crust, and end up with a stash of concentrated energy buried in the ground. That was the ultimate lottery prize of history. And we won it. But as lottery prizes do, it went to our heads and gave us some very bizarre expectations about what, which may not wear too well, as our lottery winnings no longer measure up to our collective sense of the second is what's called net energy. And this is one, you burn it into your brain, you need, to, you need to have this in mind, or you will be cheated and hornswoggled by people, by promoters. Okay, net energy is what you get when you take the amount of energy you get from a resource and subtract the amount of energy that you have to use to get the energy resource. Okay, light, sweet, crude, under natural pressure from a shallow onshore well, you don't have to worry about that. You get 300 times the energy as it takes to extract the oil. So it's practically free. You know, um, and that includes refinery costs, that includes transportation, that includes everything. Nowadays, of course, very little oil that we get comes to those description, you know, like amounts to that description, and the energy ratio has gone down to about 30 to one, which is not bad, but not what it used to be. Coal for heat is 80 to one. Turn the heat and electricity, use two thirds of it right off the bat, and um, the result is about 26 to 1. Natural gas is 20 to 1. Nuclear, 10 to 1 at best. Wind is about 8 to 1, and all the other renewables except hydroelectric are in, are in single digits. Quite a few so-called energy sources are in negative numbers. They're not energy sources, they're energy sinks. You're, you're going to hear a lot of stuff about, quote, oil shale. Okay, carriaging shales like the Green River Formation. Every three to five years, somebody announces that's the great solution. It takes more energy to extract the carriage than you get from burning the carriage, no matter what you do. Yeah. And that's why every company, you know, Shell has tried it, Exxon has tried it, every one of the, of the rogues gallery of oil companies has tried it, and they've all given up because they realize it's an absolute money loser. You know, it's like 
setting up a business where you're going to buy people's dollar bills for $2 each. Hey, you're going to do great, right? You certainly get a lot of business. <clears throat> so, that's the second issue. The third is energy subsidies. Coal isn't dug and transported using energy from coal. Solar panels are not made with solar energy. And wind turbines do not power the factories that make wind turbines. All of them are mostly powered by fossil fuels. Um, you know, you, from, from, the, from the, the big machines that dig coal to the trucks that haul the wind turbines up onto the mountains, it's all fossil fuels. And that makes many alternative energy sources look better than they are because they're getting an indirect subsidy from cheap, abundant oil. So remember that you have to account for all the energy that goes into an energy system. It doesn't come out of thin air. It has to. It's going to end up factoring into your price. And if your solar energy system is getting a huge energy subsidy from petroleum, and the petroleum runs short, all your figures are going to be off because you're going to have to replace the energy you got from petroleum with something less concentrated, less abundant, and therefore more expensive. All of this density, net energy, energy subsidy analysis was worked out during the 70s. With the coming of the 80s, all of it got chucked into the black hole where America keeps the memories it didn't want to think about. And there it sat until we started getting close to the very early years of the 21st century. The time when those charts of the 70s said the peak of world oil production was going to happen. And there we were. And the price of oil was beginning to climb again, and every economist in the world was saying, oh, it's a temporary blip. It's never going to get above $20 a gallon, or $20 a barrel, not for long. It's never going to get over $30 a barrel, not for long. Um, who's the guy? Daniel Jurgen, very famous petroleum type, said um, that oil was, uh, this was, I think, in 2004, oil was going to reach a permanent plateau at $38 a barrel. <clears throat> Care to guess what it is today? 105. 105 <clears throat> in Brent, yeah. Mm -hmm. For a while there, people in the peak oil scene were talking about how many Jurgens the price of oil is, a Jurgen being a $38. <laughs> so yeah, 3.5 Jurgens, 3.75 Jurgens, it was great. Um, <laughs> So there we were, and, and we were realizing that something was very wrong. That all those predictions back in the 70s, which were denounced and derided by all right-thinking people, had done a better job of predicting the shape of oil production than the conventional wisdom. And the future sketched out by those old predictions got the new name of peak oil, shorthand for the peak of global oil production. Now, as it happens, I was one of those few people back in the first stirrings of peak oil scene in the very late 1990s. I wasn't a big name in it then. I was one of the, on the early email lists, I got together with people like Richard Duncan and Walter Youngquist and started applying my own background in history to the question of what was coming in us. It was very much a spare time activity for me. At the time, I just succeeded after a decade of false starts in, in getting a career as a writer under the as a writer under the I was also deeply involved with Druid, with Druid Drip, I think, working through the training program of one of the, one of the major Druid orders and glancing up now and again at the shelf full of old ecology textbooks and appropriate tech manuals, the whole legacy, the dream of, of a sustainable future that I kept. And it began to dawn on me that somewhere in the cognitive space between the Druid teachings I was studying and the increasingly troubling estimates of world oil production was getting off the running on empty email list and so on, there was a way of thinking about the future that I was not seeing anywhere else. <coughs> It was a little while before I had a chance to develop that because as the legendary school essay said, well, some other stuff happened. Notably, I ended up being chucked by accident into the, into the, the hot seat of the ancient order of Druids in America. How that happened, well, as I said before, the story itself, the short form, is that if you kind of accidentally trip across a Druid order almost 100 years old that has fewer than a dozen elderly members left, and you're the first person who's expressed the least interest in its teachings in decades, and you get really enthusiastic about the teachings and, and ask the old guys if there's any way they're going to open their own doors to new members. Well, let's just say don't be surprised if they agree on condition that you get plopped into the hot seat and, oh, yes, do all the work. <laughs> <laughs> That's basically what happened. Um, so things were moving again. The first new people were joining. Uh, the, our first degree training program was about to be published under my name as the Druidry Handbook. And I decided it was time to start a blog. And I was not going to do an ordinary Druid blog if there is any such thing. Um, I wanted to talk about larger issues from a Druid perspective. And the main one I wanted to talk about was peak oil. This was not because I thought the rest of the world was going to tune in, mind you. Um, it was because I figured the Druid community probably needed to start thinking about what we were going to do 
when energy costs started to get increasingly big bites out of the economy. And a lot of us druids were going to have to follow up our talk about reverence for nature with some serious action. And since I was figured nobody but druids was ever going to read the thing, I called it the Arch Druid Report. So I started posting weekly posts, six months or so went by, with the occasional com comment from a fellow druid. And then a funny thing started to happen. Well, to be precise, two funny things. The first was that I started to realize that what I was saying about peak oil and a lot of other issues was not being said by anything, anybody else. And here's the odd thing. I was a low voice in the wilderness, but not because I was way off on one of the fringes. No. I was a lone voice because everyone else was off on one of two equal and opposite fringes, leaving a vast empty space in between with one mild-mannered arch druid trying to fill the gap. Here, here's where the gap was located. Across the peak oil blogger, one set of bloggers was with commentators loudly insisting there's nothing to worry about. We'll all be able to replace crude oil with coal or biodiesel or hydrogen or fusion power or dilithium crystals or something and go chugging onward in for forever. <coughs> At the same moment, another bunch of bloggers and commentators was insisting just as loudly that the day after the oil runs out, we're all going to die! <laughs> it was weird. Imagine checking a weather program today, and there's two meteorologists in the middle of a shouting match. One of them insists the weather tomorrow is going to be um, sunny blue skies with temperatures in three digits. And by the way, winter is never going to happen again. And the other is saying, tomorrow we're going to get an ice age and everyone's going to freeze to death. Watch out for the mountains. And on the very rare occasions, someone suggests maybe not, maybe normal spring weather, 40 degrees of rain. Not that that's normal spring weather anymore, but you get my point. Um, they get attacked by both sides. Well, I was the one saying 40 degrees of rain. And I got a lot of amusement value out of having the same blog post denounced as baseless pessimism by one set of bloggers. And delusional optimism by the other. <laughs> it's funny. And the thing is, the people who were doing the denouncing were not druids by that time. They were out there in the wider blogosphere. And that's when I noticed the second of the two funny things I mentioned a moment ago, which is the blog I'd started to talk to the druid community but getting a lot of attention outside that community. There were a lot of people reading it and commenting on it from the general public or that fraction of the general public who reads the comments on blogs. And some of them actually wanted to hear what I had to say. You know? Every so often, one of them would ask, er, um, are you actually a druid? <laughs> and the first couple of times I fielded that question, I was thinking, oh boy, here we go. Because I figured that when most people think of the world, most Americans think of the word druid, they do not think, what comes first to their minds is not qualified expert on the subject of the future industrial society. <laughs> what comes to their minds first is probably something closer to crackpot. But I drew in a deep breath and explained that yes, I am, and here's a little of what that means. And uh, but the facts I'm citing come entirely from non-druidical sources. None of them is like written in Owen letters on a standing stone somewhere. You understand? Um, and, and that's when I found out they were not. Most of them were not thinking crackpot at all. They were going, "Wow, cool, a real life druid." They were thinking, you know, somebody who actually cares about the earth might have something worth saying in this. And that's what clued me in to the fact that something was very strange. To me something very strange was going on in the peak oil dialogue and more generally in our culture's entire set of dialogues about the future. It wasn't just that peak oil scene was split down the middle between these two extreme viewpoints, one that assume, assumes the best possible future, the other that assumes the worst. It's that our whole society is split down the middle by that same sort of division. And so I started talking about that in my blog, about the power of narratives, of the stories we tell ourselves about the future, and about the way that just about every attempt people make nowadays to talk about the future gets hijacked by a very specific set of narratives. Well, no, let's risk using the proper word, a very specific set of myths. Now, we like to pretend that we don't have myths. No, no, no. We have facts. Primitive people have myths. There are even books out there insisting that amythia, the pathological lack of myths, is one of the great inner crises of our time. <clears throat> the problem with that comfortable diagnosis is that we're lying to ourselves if we believe that. Modern industrial society is riddled with myths in the classic sense of the word, of the word. Stories we consider sacred. That we use to make sense of the world, no matter how much we have to stretch and prune the world to make it fit. It's just that we don't recognize that that's what we're doing. 
which stood the old story of the emperor's new clothes on its head. The modern emperor thinks he's stark naked on the beach and can't understand why he keeps tripping and stumbling up across these heavy, these heavy ropes he thinks he's too wise to be wearing. The reason we, th we, don't, we think we don't have myths anymore is that we think myths are stories that aren't true. We talk about the Greek myths, the Norse myths, because most people nowadays don't believe in Odin or Athena. It's not considered polite to talk publicly about Christian myths, but of course that's how most people think of them. But the mythic narratives that are actually central to our culture, no, 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 if you call them myths, you won't even get an argument. More, more often than not, you get blank incomprehension. And, the people, and people will go through the most remarkable mental backflips in order not to understand what you're saying. The example I have in mind is actually the most important of our modern myths, the narrative that more than anything else defines the world for modern Americans, the myth of progress. You know that story in your bones. You learned it in school. You saw it splashed across the television screen in a thousand utterly forgettable programs. You absorbed it from every scrap of today's pop culture. The myth of progress is the story that says the whole complexity of human history is one great upward movement from the caves to the stars. <clears throat> it's a story that insists that things are newer, or the newer things are better just because they're newer. That old ways of thinking aren't just made out of fashion, but actually disproved by the passage of time. It's a very powerful myth, not least because it gives everyone the chance to play a bit part of the story of progress, and it panders to the narcissism of our time by making contemporary industrial society, humanity, the current hero of the story. That's why you hear so much hogwash these days about people in non-industrial companies, be, or countries rather, being still in the Middle Ages, or, or even still in the Stone Age, and at least as much about how we need to bring them into the 21st century. They're already in the 21st century. This is the 21st century, okay? <laughs> Hill tribes in Afghanistan and hunter-gatherers in Borneo are as much a part of the 21st century as we are. So, it's hogwash, but it's hogwash with a purpose. <laughs> the unspoken logic behind it is that all of human history is a process that leads to us, and through us to a future that's like us, but even more so. If those people in Afghanistan and Borneo were really in the 21st century, they'd live in suburbs and drive SUVs, right? <laughs> <clears throat> and waste energy like we do. So that's the great myth of our time. It has another dimension, though, which feeds the other half of the weird divide I encountered in the early days of the Archdruid Report. For, for centuries now, the rhetoric of the myth of progress has insisted the only alternative to progress is catastrophe. We've got to keep progressing, uh, or something terrible will happen. And of course, the people who manipulate that rhetoric to keep themselves rich and powerful are good at confusing the issue, so the word progress always means going further along in what specific direction they have in mind, which always turns out to be for their benefit. What that means is the people who recognize there's something very wrong about the de destination toward which all this progress is headed, but can't quite manage to pop their minds out of the rut of the myth of progress, and of longing for the catastrophe that's the only alternative to progress they can think of. They get their catastrophe from every available source, but whatever the excuse, they're longing for the disaster that will set them free from the triumphant march of progress in the wrong direction. Because there's a worm gnawing at the core of this myth of progress we believe in. People aren't excited about it anymore. They used to be. In America especially, progress used to be our joy and our pride and our hope of salvation. Nowadays, not so much. People still believe in it, but it's a matter of gritting their teeth and hoping the next round of progress won't be as tawdry and dehumanizing as the last one. That's why so many people have embraced all the various catastrophes du jour, whether we're talking the rapture or, well, you know, they, the, the Mayan calendar believers have not come up with a new date yet, I give them six months, or what have you. Um, if that's the only way off the conveyor belt of progress, they'll take it because the place the conveyor belt is going is very clearly no place any sane human being would want to go. So I think it's time or past time to point out that these ways of looking at the future are mythic narratives. They are not facts. They're not anything like as inevitable as our culture insists. Line up any one of them against the yardstick of history, and you can see that right away. Uh, the myth of progress insists that all human history is the story of progress, but um, but um, but um, upward and upward, step by step. This is what we call a, fa a faith-based statement. 
For the whole time between the agricultural revolution and the industrial age, human life basically didn't change at all. All things considered, the life of a peasant, aristocrat, or priest in, in say, Egypt under the pharaohs was indistinguishable from that of, of 17th century France. I mean, you got the Sun King Amenhotep the first, you got the Sun King Louis XIV, big difference. Industrial society broke that pattern only because we jimmied the blocks on Earth's carbon stash and burned through the majority of it into three centuries of wild extravagance. So much for the myth of progress. Now, the apocalypse myth, for its part, insists that the end of civilization must be sudden, catastrophic, and total. Um, 90 to 120 minutes in time for the credits to roll. <laughs> <laughs> History doesn't support that claim either. Rome was not sacked in a day. Civilizations take time to fall. The resource base of our society is shrinking, but it's not gone yet. Global warming under ecological disruptions, plenty of those, but those build over time. And everybody involved, most of the people involved, have every reason to try to hold things together as long as they can. The, 20th, the history of the 20th century has showed us what kind of punishment industrial societies can take and not dissolve into the kind of zombie apocalypse war of all against all that so many people like to fantasize about. So the apocalypse, but the apocalypse myth has another round, another factor in it that makes it, shall we say, dubious as a guide to the future. The unstated subtext behind everybody's apocalyptic prophecy is that the universe is under an obligation to provide people with the future that corresponds as closely as possible to the believer's bonds daydreams. You must have met the kind of survivalist who, who's just panting for the day when he finally gets to blaze away at full auto at hordes of advancing enemies. Okay, that's the apocalypse he wants, and that's the apocalypse he believes in. You've all probably met the kind of new ager whose daydreams tend toward a universe that gives you everything you want because you ask it nicely. And he's been trying to create his own reality for the last 30 years and failing. And so the kind of post-apocalyptic world that he wants is the one that the one that 2012 was supposed to bring him. Again, they'll get another date shortly enough. Is the one where his, the reality he's been trying to create for 30 years finally shows up. <clears throat> the rapture is cut from the same cloth. Okay. To begin with, it's a lightly disguised fantasy of mass suicide. When somebody tells the kids that grandma has gone to be with Jesus, I think everyone knows what that means. Like most suicide fantasies, it includes the notion that everybody's going to be really, really sorry afterwards. Although most people who have suicide fantasies don't drag in an antichrist to make sure of that. But it's another daydream. It's a moment when everyone who ever disagreed with the believer has to admit that he was wrong. <clears throat> That's a major factor in all apocalypse prophecies. And it's one of those little satisfactions that the universe just keeps on refusing to give the true believers among us. Now, of course, progress has happened. Catastrophes has happened. But the realities aren't up to the job that the myth assigns them. Both the myths, both these myths require, at this point, a deus ex machina on the grand scale to change the course of events. And ordinary catastrophe is not enough to bring an industrial society crashing down. Ordinary progress is certainly not enough to save it from its own mistakes. Without some kind of radical, extraordinary, unparalleled event, we're probably headed along the normal trajectory that civilizations go. And if there's a point in planning in the future, planning for the future, it makes sense to plan for the one we're most likely to get. And that's not a future of progress, and it's not a future of apocalypse. That's a difficult thing for many people to get their heads around, because that future, the one we're most likely to get, is not appealing. The myth of progress is appealing. The myth of apocalypse, very, they've got very powerful emotional appeal. That's why they're so popular. The myth of progress is there to comfort people who made their peace with the status quo. And they want to believe that their lives are part of a process that will lead to something better. The myth of apocalypse is there to comfort people who can't accept the status quo and want to believe in a catastrophe that will bring down the towers of a civilization they can't stand. Both of them are very emotionally powerful, but a belief can be emotionally powerful and comforting without being true. That's what I was saying. It actually fit history that well, and we'll probably fit it a lot less well as we go down further in the future. While the yelling was going on, and oh man, there was a lot of yelling, it became a minor internet phenomenon. It gets better than 200,000 page views a month at this point. And that's not counting the one to 200 other sites that carry my weekly posts. It's currently translated to eight languages. It feels to be a book contract out of the blue from a publisher I'd never talked to. And if you know a writer or are a writer, you know that usually happens shortly after the 12th of never. 
<laughs> I would like to be able to polish my ego to an otherworldly shine and claim that it was my unique personal qualities that made that happen, but of course it wasn't. What made that happen was that I was approaching the issues around the future of industrial society with a set of assumptions and analytical tools that most people had never thought of before. And that came in fact from my background and my beliefs as a druid. At the heart of what I brought to that discussion out of the druidry was what I suppose we could call the shape of time. Yes, time has a shape, or rather it has many shapes, different cultures, different spiritual traditions and so on, assign different shapes to time. To believers in the myth of progress, time is a straight line. You see it mapped out over and over again in books on history, um, on the evolution of humanity, blah, blah, blah. It starts somewhere primitive, squalid, and miserable, okay? And goes marching on ahead as a line, gaining momentum as it goes until it reaches us, and of course zooms on past us to whatever humanity's glorious destiny is going this week. <clears throat> it's always one line. Anything that diverges from that line is by definition a dead end. Within the myth, there's no way to imagine multiple avenues of progress, that are a deep, different, but equally valid um, endpoints. One dead straight line that runs from the grunting, farting, barbarian caveman we've invented to fill the role of our imaginary ancestors through us clean, well-groomed, through us flatulent, <laughs> onto the great leap onward into forever. That's the shape of time in modern industrial society. The myth of apocalypse just inverts that. There you have the golden age. You have the invention of, you have the fall. It's the Christian version of the fall. But the Christians call it the fall. The Marxists call it the invention of private property. Um, various people have various names for it. The, the, the eating of meat. You can fill in the blank. There's always something that brings about the end of the golden age, the time of darkness into which we now, and then there will be the great catastrophic transformation, uh, the rapture, the proletarian revolution, what, you know, what have you. And then we go back to the golden age. And that's it. There's no second time around. It's just this one thing happens. Boom, boom, boom. Straight line. That's the shape of time in modern industrial culture. It's not the shape of time we understand, as we understand in Druidry. In Druidry, as in nature, time is a circle marked by the spokes of the seasons. And that implies certain things we can expect for the future. If you know that time is a circle and the seasons are stations along the circumference, you know that after spring comes summer, after summer, autumn, after autumn, winter, and then you come back around to spring. If somebody tells you that after summer comes uber summer, and after uber summer comes uber uber summer, and the harvest just keeps rolling in bigger and bigger all the time, and there's no need to put any side, anything aside for winter, because of course winter doesn't happen anymore, well basically you roll your eyes and say something polite like, you're nuts. <laughs> and they are, but we've covered that. After summer <laughs> comes autumn, after autumn, comes winter. The concept that I've tried to insert into the collective conversation of our time is the concept of winter, of decline. Not progress, onward and upward forever, not sudden overwhelming catastrophe, but the recognition that civilizations rise and fall at their own slow pace, and ours is not exempt from the common fate. Civilizations, like everything else, move in a circle. They have a life cycle. They're born. They expand, they outrun their resource base, they decline, and then they die and leave whatever legacy they've created, the civilizations of the future. That's the wheel of the year and the great wheel of time. It's also what history shows very clearly. Once you silence the parrot that says, progress or catastrophe, progress or catastrophe, over and over again in your head. <laughs> That's what I've been saying in the Archfruit Report and elsewhere. That industrial civilization has reached the point of its lifestyle where decline has set in that we're already in decline in important ways. We've been in decline for decades. And only the myth of progress keeps us from noticing that the few things that are improving are massively outweighed by the great number of things that are contracting or collapsing. That if we track the peak of global oil production and match that up to the peaks of other crucial resources, you've got a fairly good measure of the way the bottom is dropping out of the bucket. And the slogans being trotted out by believers in progress, that the market will take care of it. This or that or the other energy source will that it's all the fault of the liberals, or the conservatives, or David Icke's evil space lids, or just somebody, and if we just blame them loudly enough, that will take care of it. But all these slogans may make people feel good for the time being, but they are the functional response to the very tight corner industrial civilization has backed itself into, no, 
to be, has progressed into. <laughs> so what kind of future do we face if it's not progress and it's not catastrophe? Again, decline. It's nearly an unthinkable concept these days. I've watched people practically turn their heads inside out, trying not to think it, trying to stay comfortably stuck in the rut that says that progress is a law of nature, history has a permanent upward slant to it, and the only way it won't happen is there's a big enough catastrophe. The fact remains that until the industrial world broke into the Earth's store of fossil carbon around 300 years ago, progress was a very occasional thing, and it was balanced precisely by regress. Kingdoms, cultures, civilizations rose, and then they fell. We've had a very steep rise over the last two centuries, no, no question. But it's purely a matter of faith that leads people today to think that it won't be followed by a fairly steep fall, unfolding over the next few centuries finally bottoming out in the usual way in a dark age, leaving the ground ready for new civilizations to rise. That's what history has to say. Now, of course, it's very unfashionable nowadays to suggest that we have anything to learn from the past. I've long, suggest, I've long suspected that this is because what we generally learn from the past is that we've just made the same mistake for the 13th time, and we'll be making it for the 14th very soon. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever read John Kenneth Galbraith's excellent book, The Great Crash, 1929 haven't, get it, <coughs> read it. It is the funniest, wittiest, most side-splitting book of serious economic history you'll ever read. Um, those who have will have noted that every absurd detail of the 1929 stock market promotion was repeated in any case word for word. In the tech stock bubble that burst in 2000, the housing bubble that popped in 2008, and well, you get the same rhetoric right now focused on shale oil. That's the bubble du jour. Uh, did you know that Wall Street right now is busy packaging and selling shale leases the way they were packaging and selling mortgages a few years back? Yeah. Give it a year or so, you're going to know much more about that than you want to. <coughs> the rise and fall of civilizations produce the same embarrassment on a somewhat larger scale. I mean, do you think our civilization is the first to outrun its resource base? Not a chance. It happens all the time. And we know beyond a doubt what happens when civilizations do that. They go under. Clive Ponting's A Green History of the World documents dozens of societies that got tipped into Gaia's compost bin for exactly that reason. I know it's standard these days to think, you know, we're different. We're special. We're marked out by some providence or other for a unique fate, whether it's onward, the onward and upwards to a Star Trek future metastasizing across the galaxy or what have you, or the pl overnight plunge into oblivion that the myth of apocalypse promises us. But, you know, every other civilization in history thought that it was different and special. They all went the same way. <coughs> Even thinking about the possibility that the same thing might happen to us is more than most people are willing to do these days. But I'd like to suggest that as we go further along the trajectory, the very familiar trajectory toward our own future, more and more people are going to have to think about it because it's happening around them. We're not different. We're not special. We're fooling ourselves when we insist that historical change can only move in one direction, the direction in which it happens to have gone for the last 300 years or so, and pretty clearly isn't going anymore. A hundred years ago, you got exactly the same logic applied by people who insisted that war between civilization, civilized nations rather, was a thing of the past. Now, war between the nations of Europe did become steadily less common over the course of the 18th and 19th centuries, and a great many people convinced themselves but that will continue straight into the 20th, making the 20th century a century of universal world peace. You may have noticed how well that worked out. <clears throat> the same logic gets used constantly today. I'm thinking right now of the mockery that got flung at Jim Constable, one of my other, one of my fellow pink oil writers, a few years back when he published his book, The Long Emergency. One of the things he suggested in that book is that as, industri as the industrial age rise, winds down, we're going to see a rise of a piracy. I don't recall a single reviewer of the book who took that seriously. Most people mocked him. He was a field day with it, though they shut up with a in a hurry once pirate raids off Somalia suddenly hit the news. <laughs> of course, Gunsler is right. Piracy is already a serious problem in several parts of the world. When he wrote, it's gotten much worse since then, and once fuel shortages start to limit the reach of modern navies and economic crises add to the roster of failed states, it's going to turn into a serious factor influencing global trade. Is anybody paying attention? Surely you jest. People think that since piracy belongs to the past, it can't belong to the future. We need to get over the sense of entitlement that claims that we can count on progress forever, or even that we can count on holding on to what we've got. 
We've got what we've got only because we raided the Earth's cookie jar of excess carbon and stripped it as bare as our sticky little fingers would permit. We used the proceeds to create an economy of abundance, of extravagance, and talked ourselves into thinking that it wasn't the coal, the oil, the natural gas we were using so voraciously that did it. No, 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 no. We were just so much smarter than anyone else who'd ever lived. And we continue to cling to that fantasy. Even as the carbon wealth that made the abundance possible is trickling away and taking our economy with it. The thing that has to be grasped here now is that peak oil is not a thing of the future. It's here. There have been all kinds of press releases, those that simply haven't been denouncing the idea of peak oil um, up one side and down the other. They've been talking about, you know, peak oil could happen 20 years from now. It might happen within 50 years. <clears throat> all very comforting until you actually check the numbers and realize that world production of conventional petroleum has been stuck in a plateau since 2004, with production right around 84 billion barrels a year. The price of oil has zoomed since then, averaging four times now what it was in 2004. Do you remember all those economists who insisted that the law of supply and demand would take care of it? As prices go up, new supplies would show up on demand to, to bring the price back down. We all heard that kind of crap. It didn't happen. And it didn't happen because when the laws of economics go head to head with the laws of physics and geology, the laws of economics always lose. Okay. What makes this even more challenging is that since 2004, the only reason liquid fuel production has remained more or less level is that we've been throwing everything into the gas tank that will burn. Ethanol, biodiesel, tar sand extracted, natural gas liquids, or frack shale, you name it, we're burning. All those have much lower net energy than conventional petroleum does. All of them require very big energy subsidies. It takes a lot of diesel fuel to grow the corn and oil seed for ethanol and biodiesel, and a lot of natural gas to process into liquid fuel. It takes a lot of diesel fuel to drill and frack oil, uh, holes in oil shale. And let's not even talk about the amount of natural gas they use to extract the tar from the tar sands and to turn it into some, some approximation of oil. <coughs> All that fuel that has to go into energy extraction is not available for other uses. It's an energy cost of energy production. It's one of the things that driving, uh, is driving up fuel prices, but nobody's talking about it in those terms, because if you talk about it in those terms, you have to realize the corner we've backed ourselves into. Nobody's talking about the net energy, or even the economics of our desperate attempts to keep our gas tanks topped up. We've got to have our fuel, because otherwise, well, otherwise the party's over. It means the mythic narratives on which we've staked our lives are empty air, and that means we have to face up to the very hard questions that our civilizations have tried to, our civilizations have tried to insist were answered forever. And those questions include centrally the questions that Druids have been trying to raise for the last three centuries. Industrial civilization has tried to pretend all along that, that humanity is not a part of nature. You've all heard the slogan meaning about man's conquest of nature. You notice it's always man is one of them. Male, presumably well hung, striding boldly forward into the future. Come on, okay? Man's conquest of nature, what this implies is that humanity has declared war on life, has declared war on every other living thing there is, and every natural system there is. To say that this is not a bright idea is one of history's great understatements. Mm -hmm. What makes it not merely stupid but suicidal is that our lives depend moment by moment on the natural systems against which we think we can declare war. The oxygen you just breathed was put there by a green plant. The water you drink got to your tap by a diversion of nature's water cycle. The soil, the topsoil, sun, rain, and genetic heritage that produced every part of your breakfast was not created by you or any other human being. And all those airy assurances that someday soon we can just do without them and go capering off across the hard <coughs> light of vacuum of outer space are looking pretty thin these days. We can't conquer nature. We can't replace nature. We can't even destroy her, although you know what? We could die trying. <coughs> I'd like to suggest this is not a good idea. I'd like to suggest instead that we need to take a good, hard look at our fantasies of collective omnipotence, our sense of entitlement as a species, as a civilization, as a nation, and as individuals, and replace those with attitudes that do a better job of dealing with the realities of the human condition. It was one of many species on a beautiful and delicate planet that will only sustain our lives as long as we sustain hers. 
That means we also need to ask some good hard questions about how we live our lives. That's been the missing ingredient in the entire discussion around the future of society since the end of the 70s. I'm sure all of you will remember with some clarity what happened at the climate change talks in Copenhagen a few years ago. The United States, the EU, China, everyone else, they were really willing to see sweeping cuts in carbon emissions by someone else. Okay. And things were no different here at home. Very few of even the people who are really passionate about climate change were willing to stop doing the things that were driving climate change. We all remember Al Gore's frequent flyer miles and his colossal air conditioned mansion, which did more to destroy climate change activism than anything the Heritage Foundation could do. All the people who talked, you know, who went to protests and then drove home alone in their SUVs. That gutted any hope that movement had. Because a great many people in this country and a great many people in the world are used to the, the fact that various people make grand and sweeping claims as an attempt to grab a larger share of the pie. And that's what happened to a lot of the green movement. It got pegged by a lot of people outside it as, okay, a bunch of middle class hypocrites trying to take a step. So, you know, we need to get past finger pointing. Even if some of the people at whom fingers are pointed do in fact deserve their share of the blame. So does each of us. The 5% of us who live here in America, please remember, use a quarter of all the energy used on Earth. And we consume, a, we consume a third of the world's output of raw materials and a third of its industrial product. That isn't because the rest of the human race doesn't want these things, mind you. Uh, it's certainly not because the United States produces some product or other that's so desirable that everyone else is willing to give up us a third of the world's wealth in order to get it. We can have a long conversation about global power and structural economic imbalances and the troops that we have garrisoned in 140 countries around the world right now. And the fact that our military budget equals the military budgets of every other country in the world put together. But that's a topic for a different day. We don't notice the extravagant wealth and waste that surrounds us because we've all grown up with it. The rest of the world does notice it. And it's high time that we start noticing it, too, because that lack of awareness is crippling most of our attempts to do something about the crisis of our time. It's too many people insist that we can keep on living those SUV lifestyles, that each of us can keep on using as much energy and resources as a mid-sized village in the third world, and use more every year. We can't. Not indefinitely. And the longer we fool ourselves into thinking we can, the deeper we wedge ourselves into a dead end from which many of us will not be able to extract ourselves. The fact of the matter is that we all need to use less. Not just a little bit less, a lot less. L-E-S-S, -S, the mantra for the future. Less energy, stuff, and stimulation. That latter, because the constant flow of chatter from the media, <coughs> is a drug we use to numb ourselves to the realities of our situation. To make us forget the things that we're actually looking for and sickening and dying for lack of are not things you can buy. It's not actually that hard to use a lot less energy in a lot of stuff. The average European uses a third as much energy per year as the average American, and you know, they don't live in caves. By most measures, they have a better lifestyle than we do. And we could all live the same way. We could live even more simply, and you know what? Once you get past the shock of doing with less, it's actually kind of fun. <coughs> Speaking of technological gimcracks, <laughs> how people meant to know? The idea that we need to find the myths that will, that will nurture us, that will heal us, that will give us the energy to do the right things. And that's not done by, fil by figuring it out in advance. That's done by each person finding the narratives and the stories and the ways of, the, the ways of understanding the world that work for them. And so what, you've, what? Got, you've got a myth. And that's not a bad thing. Every, everybody has them. Okay? If you don't think you have a mythic narrative that structures your view of the world, you're just not, you haven't reflected enough. You haven't seen the myth. Most people don't realize the myth of progress is hardware into their brain until you start poking them and say, what if progress is over? <laughs> and then you get the reactions. <laughs> what if progress is over? Not just for now. Over. Forever. Okay. Well, so, one of the ways that I hold this, uh, or mm -hmm. I feel it, and I feel it in others, is the knowing and the not knowing. Mm -hmm. Like we know. We know what we're going towards. We know the type of mm -hmm. relationship we want to have mm -hmm. with with life. 
And then there's a lot of not knowing, and there's this kind of yeah. fluid thing, and mm -hmm. uh, we're okay with that, mm -hmm. and we're building webs of knowledge and um, allowing mm -hmm. for diversity, which is mm -hmm. another word maybe for um, dis dissensus. dissensus. Yeah, di dissensus is the deliberate pursuit of diversity. Uh -huh. It's, you know, encouraging people to be weird and go off on their own paths. And to, to be, you know, to be weird. <laughs> Example. I know, I've, I've, I've been contacted by some people, I've had, I don't know them personally, I've never been face to face with them, who are involved in what's what's called, trying to build what are called Bussard fusion reactors. It's a B-U-S-S-A-R-D. It is a, a theoretical idea for a small scale fusion reactor, a basement level fusion reactor. <coughs> um, which in theory should be relatively safe, it actually works, which it almost certainly won't. Um, will turn out vast amounts of energy and save the world, blah, blah, blah. I think it's a crock, but I encourage them to go ahead with it. If there's a chance that that's going to be a good thing, they have that covered. They're busy in their basements. Many of them have actually gotten some little bit of nuclear fusion, nowhere to break even. But, you know, to encourage people to do things even if you think they're wrong, even if you think they're nuts. That's in a sense. Um, other questions? Or comments? Go ahead. Uh, could you elaborate a little more on why it's impossible or impractical to produce, say, wind turbines or solar panels using the energy? Okay, good, good. That's an excellent point, excellent question. Now, I am going to start by quibble. Okay, it's a very important skill here. There are solar power plants. There's solar power and wind power, and there's solar power and wind power. Are we talking about a couple of panels on your roof or a little domestic wind turbine that could get over your roof? Those you can make. Those are. I, I have made a wind turbine using a surplus truck alternator, a turbine that was carved out of wood by us. It was a bunch of us at college. You know, um, some scrap metal and things like this, and it produced 12 volts nights and even to keep the chicken house life. The chickens were very appreciative. You can do that. And they will be, as long as we can preserve the technology, we can possibly do that for thousands or even millions of years in the future. In the same way, there are kinds of solar power that can be made that kind of home scale, basement scale manufacture that can be done forever. Um, solar water heating. Okay. Even in here, solar water heating will probably save 60 to 70% of your water heating bills. If you can afford it, look into it. It's an excellent technology. It was mature 100 years. So that's my little sales pitch for solar power. It's an excellent system, and I suspect it will be in use for a very, very long time. Now, the kind of wind turbines that everyone likes to talk about nowadays, which are designed to feed the grid and stand on it as being tall and sort of move this kind of ghostly motion, um, and you know, Oscarized birds and bats and things like that, those have to be made with extremely exacting special alloys, it requires rare earth metals, it requires very <coughs> engineering components, and then you have to truck those things out to the high places where they can. You're talking about something that a society that has sharply limited energy sources can't afford to do anymore. We can afford to do it now because we've got all this petroleum. But when you realize, when, when what you've got is that you have X amount of energy, you have to like feed people, and provide basic services? Can you afford to maintain all of the infrastructure necessary to build these things? Almost certainly not. Um, solar cells, as they're currently created, are actually the, the, um, the ultimate test case for this. To make a solar cell, you have to have incredibly demanding situations. You have to have clean rooms. You have to have a whole range of extra extraordinarily toxic solvents. You have to have silicon purified to um, I forget how few parts per billion. You have to have an immense, you have to be able to put on monomolecular layers of metals in a vacuum. All of this, none of this stuff just kind of appears in there. All of it has to be manufactured and maintained by energy. Also by raw materials, by labor, by others. But you have to have the energy to do these and to produce the plants, to make the chips. Um, that kind of extravagance is not going to be available to us when we're having to work on the triple of energy we can get from sun and wind and human muscle. 
So what this means is not that solar energy is a bad idea, but it means that the kind of solar energy, frankly, we used to do in the 70s, the rooftop hot, hot water heater, the, um, you know, the Savonius wind turbines went bump it, bump it, bump it, over your roof. Those are the way of the future. Again, the big installations are just so far and center. So, <laughs> so that's, that's the quibble that I want to make here. Now, where the line falls between those, heck, that's a good question. We don't know yet. My suggestion is start from the simple stuff. Start from the stuff you can do with your own basement and scale up as circumstances permit. And by the way, if we're, if, if us peak oil geeks are right, and every evidence suggests we are, and the price of natural gas is going to go through its little dip that it's doing now, and when the fracking bubble pops, it's going to start going up, and go up to record levels in the wake of the fracking bubble, because in the wake of the fracking bubble, nobody's going to be drilling. Um, if you have a side business putting in solar water heaters, or insulation, or all the other things that you can do, you will, you will make yourself a handy living retrofitting people's houses so they don't have to freeze in the dark. Okay. So, um, don't bet the farm on it, but it's just a suggestion. Questions? I saw a hand over here. Yeah. Um, John, I was curious, um, what kind of suggestions would you have um, for skills and perhaps um, creations and these kind of things that, that we could do right now with the energy system that we have? Meaning, say, like, we were just we were discussing um, printing presses and things like that. Oh, like, these kind of things that we could, yeah. using the energy paradigm we have now to make things for the long term. Basically, the, the, the conversation Paul is referring to is one that what we've actually had extensively on, online and also in person since, since I arrived here, actually since we picked up in Toledo. Mm -hmm. um, and the point of it is that, well, there are two points, really. On the one hand, we're going to need certain skills as the industrial system gradually comes unglued around us in order to keep ourselves provided with goods and services. Okay. The best, now, Everybody who thinks in investment terms likes to think in terms of stored wealth. They're not storing wealth, they're storing money. Money is not wealth, it's a system of tokens. Gold is just another system of tokens. Okay. The only source of wealth is the ability, the only source of wealth that endures is the ability to produce it. The real investment that matters is the ability to produce goods and services. This is why, if you have no, no other skill, I have uh, no other particular talent, I have something to recommend to you. You're trying to think, what am I going to do when, you know, if, if, if everything gets horrible? Learn how to brew good beer. Okay? <laughs> if the four horsemen of the apocalypse right up to your doorway, hand them a cold one, they will be your friends. Okay? In the most apocalyptic times imaginable, if you can brew good beer, you will have friends. And people will, will trade you what you need. Okay. This is America. You know, in France, it would be one. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, so basically, that's that's only one example. It's an example that people get and people laugh at, and I'm, also, I'm satisfied with both. But there are many different goods and services that people actually need that we have very few arrangements to provide, other than have them made on sweat and sweatshops on the other end of the planet and shipped here by incredibly energy efficient. You're not going to make a living manufacturing these things now, although you may do very nicely bartering with other friends in the sustainability scene. Okay, you know, whether in a cave, or even in the sort of rural commune that the people of my generation like to fantasize about when they forget how badly that turned out back in the day. <laughs> it has to do with conserving, cutting, cutting our energy use, going back to simpler and less extravagant ways of doing things, giving up on the delusion that another round of overpriced consumer goods we don't really want will make us any happier than the last batch did. All the things we started doing in the 70s, all the things we abandoned when we collectively drank the Kool-Aid becoming the Reagan years, they're still there. They're still the one meaningful response to the crisis of the <coughs> fantasies of the planet. They're all things that can be done, that have to be done by each of us as individuals. That's the missing piece in today's talk about green futures and social change. Most people want to talk about big collective changes, about passing laws and transforming whole systems. And only very rarely do they talk about the necessary precondition for changing whole systems, which is personal transformation, starting with the basic subsystems. So the statue of Paulo said in Rainier Maria Rilke, du musst dein Leben ändern, you must change your life. 
And here again, we're up against one of the lessons that the Druid revival has always taught, and in point of fact, that every one of the world's spiritual traditions has always taught. I mentioned earlier that progress doesn't have the magic for us that it once did. One of the reasons for that, I'd like to suggest, is that we've misunderstood what progress is or what it could be. We've gone way past the point of beating our material needs, which is a reasonable thing to aim for. We've gone past the point of our actual wants and desires. Now we have entire industries dedicated to inventing imaginary new desires for us and then convincing us to have them. <coughs> all to prop up an economic system that for all practical purposes amounts to an arrangement for converting irreplaceable natural resources into pollution and waste at the fastest possible rate. And it doesn't satisfy us. That's the irony of it. We fill our eyes and our ears with the flashing lights and can noise of the media to try to hide from the fact that our consumer lifestyles don't make us happy. They don't fulfill our real needs. They certainly don't make us better people or give us a meaningful response to the realities of life or the inevitability of death. We go to shopping malls and wander the aisles like lost souls because most of us are trying to run away from the fact that the thing that we're actually looking for is not for sale, not there, not in any mall, anywhere. It can't be found in a store because it's in ourselves and it's in each other. And we're going to have to deal with that. One way or another, we are going to change our lives. That's the message peak oil has for us. That's the message the future has for us. We can do it voluntarily, deliberately, in a way that preserves many of the best things the last 300 years of extravagance have brought our way, or we can keep insist on insisting that our lifestyles are non-negotiable and lose it all. That's a collective choice, but it's also an individual choice. Because each of us can choose to downshift and downscale, to learn how to, use, how to live a humane and decent lifestyle with much, with much less energy, and use the time before we have to, to get good at it. Or we can refuse, put the pedal to the metal, and slam headfirst into a very unlikely future. Now, it's only fair to point out that most of American society has the pedal pressed hard against the metal. It's only fair to point out that the difficult future I've been talking about isn't really in the future anymore. Since 1972, the standard of living of most Americans has been in steady decline. Since 2005, the global production potential or conventional petroleum, the stuff with the high net energy that can support a complex civilization like this one, has been in decline. Since 2008, the global economy has been in decline, no matter how ingeniously people come up with ways to um, you know, <coughs> generate funny money and spin the presses and gimmick this and goose that. Every year, we're having to throw more real wealth, more energy, more resources, more labor, more capital, more of everything else that an economy needs to run on into the struggle to keep petroleum production from dropping like a rock. Most things you increase investment, you increase the amount of wealth that comes out of it. But that's not the way depletion works. Here, you have to spend more and more to get the same amount, or even spending more and more to get less and less. It's a black hole. How much of the economy can it swallow? Well, we're probably going to find out. But that sort of downward spiral has predictable effects on our collective life and our built environment. It's something that happens in the twilight years of every civilization, and it's happening in our front on schedule. Go, go read up on the last century or so of the Roman Empire, or the last century or so of classical the Mayan civilization, or what have you, any other fallen civilization you care to name. You'll find the same thing. It's not sudden, and it's not straight across the board. Here and there at first, the population starts to <coughs> Cities start to lose people. You get abandoned houses, abandoned ruins, getting started on the process that will turn them into nice romantic ruins for archaeologists to dig up. Public services break down. Common or garden variety, corruption and mismanagement stop being a minor nuisance because the resources to make up for them don't exist anymore. Farms start springing up in what used to be urban neighborhoods. Does any of this sound familiar? <laughs> <laughs> Whenever a civilization comes apart, this is what happens. It happens in certain places first, and then spreads out from those cities and regions that are the immediate epicenters. They're tracing out a trajectory that everyone else, everywhere else is going to follow in due time. You're tracing out this trajectory. All of you here. The same trajectory they saw unfolding in Tikal and Rome and a hundred other places as earlier civilizations went the way ours was going. Science fiction writer William Gibson likes, likes to say, the future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed, and he's right. Except the future isn't going to be the kind of high-tech, high-waste um, energy scene that Gibson predicted in his SF novels. That's the past. I mean, that is so 20th century. <laughs> the future isn't in Silicon Valley, much less virtual space. The future is here, here in Detroit here in the Rust Belt more generally. This is the future, and you are already living in it. Here's the thing. 
Once or twice in a century, America reinvents itself. And that reinvention always happens in a specific region. One part of the country takes the lead, and the rest follows in due time. The last time that happened was in the early to middle part of the 20th century. And it happened in California. What happened in Hollywood, LA generally, Haight-Ashbury, Silicon Valley, invent, reinvented what America was about. Before then, at the turn of the last century, it was Chicago and the reason around it. It's been various <coughs> places at various times, all the way back to the narrow bit of eastern seaboard, between Boston and Philadelphia in the 1760s and 1770s, when America invented itself the first time around. This time, I think it's going to happen in the Rust Belt. I can't prove that, of course. You never can. To the urban sophisticates in New York City in the 1920s, the thought that an obscure little cow town on the Pacific Coast called Los Angeles or something like that, was going to become the creative capital of the nation would have been hilarious if anybody had, had imagined it. But I've done a lot of traveling in the Rust Belt. I've seen people in a handful of cities, and Detroit is one of them, beginning to take on the challenges of an age of decline in a way that nobody else is doing yet. And I think that this may just be where the lightning is going to strike next, where the sort of creative ferment might be happening that could teach people that there are things that matter more than the shock-worn fantasy of perpetual progress, the frantic race to heap up as much shoddy consumer garbage as possible before you die, and all the rest of it, where a vision could be kindled that might just help the world manage the long, hard journey ahead of it with some kind of grace. I can't take you to the place where you can find that vision. I certainly can't tell you to your lives, though I'm sure you notice I have a few suggestions to offer. I hope that some of you, at least, will find the courage and the vision to pursue that. Not because it's popular, because it isn't, and it won't be. Not because it's convenient, because it's not. Not because the people around you are going to understand what you're doing and why, because they won't. But simply because it's the right thing to do. But there again, one of the core teachings of Druidry is that nobody can do anybody else's spiritual work for them. Nobody can make anyone else's decisions. If you choose to follow a guru or a messiah, still you make a choice. And whether you choose to keep on following the trajectory of our civilization toward the brick wall that's waiting for it, or whether you choose to start on the path of changing your life and creating a livable future, that's also up to you. Thank you. <clears throat>
So it would be a total disaster for the Rockefellers. It would be a horrible thing for the rich. I'm not too worried. <laughs> <laughs> Most people, well, it, it, would, it would be very difficult. I would really encourage you to read up on the, the collapse of the, of the mark in Weimar Germany. It's a very good example, extremely well documented. It will give you a clear idea of what it's like, the trauma, and how people survived, as of course most of you did. Because this is one of those places, history is, the, the, we have this fantasy that says we are exempt from history, it's all, we're, we're different, it will be different this time. And it's different this time, is what everybody says when they're pitching a speculative bubble. Okay. No, you really, you should, you should you should really like these new tech stocks I have to offer. No, no, it's different this time. It's not going to blow up and take away your savings. To some extent, America is a stock market bubble at this point. And it's going to take away a lot of savings when it pops, including a lot of those of the Chinese, and I'm not too sure I'm happy what they're likely to do <laughs> in response. But at any rate, um, so the fi certainly financial explosions and implosions and collapses will add to the local color of the long road down, mm -hmm. but I'm not too concerned because, because <coughs> money is not wealth. Money is a set of arbitrary tokens we use to distribute wealth. And you can have the money system go through the most profound gyrations and it doesn't actually have that much effect on wealth because wealth is actual physical goods and services that people need. Um, you know, when you put in potatoes, I hope you're planning on putting potatoes in your garden this year. Uh, when you plant your potatoes and, and your radishes, and, that's real wealth. Even though no money ever changes hands, well, except for your seed tomatoes, unless you were sensible and saved some from last year. Um, yeah. So I, I, I have actually discussed that on a couple of points in the Archdor report, and but but there is so much fear being spread these days that I, you know it does come up. And check the history. Read up on what happens when currencies collapse, mm -hmm. and you will find that. The, that information will help make you less vulnerable to the kind of manufactured panic that's going on. Good. Okay, next question. Anything? Go ahead. Yeah. You have, you have okay. your hand up. Come on. All right. Um, so you talked about um, how obviously America is consuming so much more resources than anyone else. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think this is breeding a lot of discontent. And then we've got military bases all over the world, mm -hmm. and it's breeding a lot of discontent. And I'm wondering. Yeah. How do you think that sort of worldwide view <laughs> towards America is going to shape the American long descent? Um, it's not going to make life easy for us. By the way, one thing that, pe that there's always somebody who asks, and there may, in, in a, there may be one somebody here who's saying, well, should I move to another country? Don't, unless you want to be torn to pieces by a screaming mob, <laughs> because <laughs> Americans are not going to be too popular. Um, I think it's a really hard question to settle. It depends on how the details of international politics work out on the way down. Mm -hmm. As our <clears throat> empire comes unglued, as our ability to pump wealth out of the rest of the world collapses, <coughs> the complexities <coughs> are, are really huge. The Chinese may kind of deal with this. They could do it. Mm -hmm. They could do the way we kind of deal with England. You know, when the, when the British Empire went down in Flint, we basically moved in on them. We, we occupied them with troops. We saved their bums twice from the Germans. And said, okay, fine, guess what? Your empire is ours now. And you're not going to argue because we're going to pat you on the head and give you a place in our inner, inner circle of allies. The Chinese could do that to us. And, and it would be a very clever thing for them to do. I'm not sure if they will. Um, in which case, you know, we'll probably be as sheltered as anybody would. Um, we could end up fighting in the proxy war with the Chinese someplace and losing, in which case it could be really ugly. There's all kinds of things. History is history is messy. Okay. Um, the one thing that almost always helps is getting some control over at least part of your own food supply, make, minimizing your exposure to debt, minimizing your costs for energy and other other necessities, so that you can deal with these things as they happen. Okay. Other questions. I think it was in the protected. Future, you talk about eco villages and that the time perhaps will come sometime down mm -hmm. the road, but now is really not the time for that. There's certain well, it, um, uh, thing, things that have phases that have to kind of go be gone mm -hmm. through to get there. We can't almost rush that. We have to kind of wait for a natural <coughs> progression to get mm -hmm. there. Can you talk more about that? Yeah. Um, 
Well, I'm going to start here. One of the things, <coughs> one of the things that, had, that I have been very impressed by in looking around some of the alternative things here in uh, southeastern Michigan is that you don't see a lot of the very high cost stuff that I used to see on, out on the west, where you have these serried ranks of solar panels and um, expensive this and high tech that, and you know this house has clearly had a quarter of a million dollars of energy efficiency put into it. Mm -hmm. I saw a lot of that in Southern Oregon. And people were saying, yeah, well, this is the wave of the future. I'm going, you're nuts. <laughs> what I have seen out here has been a lot more home scale, a lot more do it yourself, and that impresses me. Um, there's, there are eco villages, and there are eco villages. <laughs> About every two months, I get, I get contacted by somebody who has this great plan for building this network of eco villages, and, and you know, they're like going to be surrounded by permaculture tree farms, and all the houses are going to be solar heated, and they're going to have the wind turbine. It's all going to cost about a quarter million dollars a person. Now, do they have a quarter million? Of course they don't have a quarter million dollars, but it's a really neat plan. Okay, the time for those will never come. Um, the eco villages that we will have in the future, very likely, are going to look rather more like the villages of, say, medieval England, except maybe with some wind turbines, and maybe with a little electricity, and maybe with a better sense of sanitation. I hope. <laughs> and. Um, is the, are we there yet? Well, you know, hell, hell if I'm getting that past the code. You know, building inspectors and things like that. Um, and there are intermediate stages that might be possible, but you have to remember, we can't just move to an eco-village someplace and then just sort of, you know, uh, fill up the roads and exist in blissful uh, solitude. You still got to pay your property taxes. You still got to deal with the health inspectors and the, and the building codes and things like that, as long as the existing system lasts. So. There's a transition process. I hate to use that word because it's been used in a range of ways, not all of them. Are but there is a process of transition that has to be gone through from which the eco-villages of the future may evolve. Um, one, of the, one of the other principles, which I probably should have put into the talk, but I, I mentioned it in the, those of you who were in Ann Arbor yesterday will remember this, the concept of dissensus. We've all heard about consensus. Everyone agrees and it's all. Well, what if we don't know the right answer? What if nobody knows the right answer? Consensus is not a good idea because if, say, you have one chance in a hundred of getting the right answer and everyone agrees on answer number 59 and the right answer is number 38, your odds are not good. Consensus is a useful thing when you have to make a single decision, but when you don't, dissensus is far more useful. What's dissensus? It's a concept created by Ewa Ziarek, who was an ethical theorist, um, so in the 1990s, when she book, wrote her book on it. <coughs> and it's the principle of avoidance of consensus. It's the deliberate decision to have different people do different things, even if they're completely contradictory to each other. To try all the possible options. So if the answer that works is answer number 39, somebody's going to try it. They need the weirdo down the street, and you're looking at him, and you're like, what the heck is that guy up to? And he gets the right thing. Or it may be you, or it may be someone else. Dissensus is the, dissensus is the way evolution works. Okay, the you know um, a bunch of a, a bunch of apes did not get together and come to a consensus to get down to the tree and start walking around and pick up rocks and throw them. Okay, what happened is that a few that did that found it possible to survive because the forests were thinning out in the plants. Okay, just the dissensus is creation from the fringes, and if we are going to have eco villages, they're going to happen on the fringes. They're going to happen by people making incremental experimental attempts in their own lives, in their own communities, with their own friends. And, let, and, the, and the ones that work will thrive, and the ones that don't work will crash and burn, and that's good. Because that's, you know, that's Darwin. I'm a great fan of Charles Darwin. <laughs> but yeah, we need a Darwinian approach to this, and that's, that is and to, to, to a whole range of things, but especially toward the settlements of community forms of the future. To be willing to experiment, to be willing to fail. And so not put all the rights in the rest of it. Have I avoided your question? <laughs> <laughs>